Welcome to Menlo Online. I'm Mark, campus pastor at our Mountain View campus, and we are so glad you've joined us today. We hope this entire service, from music to message, is encouraging and helpful for you. Whether you're part of one of our six campuses here in the Bay Area, or if you're joining us from anywhere around the world, 
Now, we know that 2020 has been a challenging year and really isolating because we can't meet in person the way that we would like to. And one of our best ways to connect as a church right now is through one of our Facebook groups. We've created Facebook groups for each of our campuses where you can connect with others throughout the week. You can get the most up-to-date information. You can share prayer requests, connect with our staff and more. And we're even hosting campus watch parties now on the weekend so we can participate in the weekend services together as campuses online. And you can go to facebook.com slash Menlo Church and join one of our groups. I also wanna say a big thanks today because last weekend across all of our campuses, we hosted a backpack drive for kids in under-resourced schools and some in the foster care system. And so far we've collected 370 backpacks full of school supplies that'll go to those kids. And it's because of your ongoing generosity that we're able to continue important outreach just like that one and so much more. And to partner with us through giving, you can text the number on your screen or visit menlo.church slash give. You can set up a recurring donation, which is what my family and I do, because God is still calling us to help people find and follow Jesus. And you can be part of that through your giving. As many of you are aware, our church is in a season of transition. A couple of weeks ago, John Ortberg stepped down as senior pastor after 17 years, and that's a big change. And that can bring a lot of emotion and change can be hard even in the best of times. So we are committed to walking through this together. And it's more important now than ever that we fix our eyes on the one who does not change because God is faithful, God is good, God is steadfast. And so as we enter into a time of worship right now, remembering God's goodness and God's faithfulness, I encourage you online not to skip over the songs and go to the sermon or start washing the dishes or get distracted. Maybe you're sitting in your living room Maybe you're sitting outside. Maybe you're not gonna sing out loud like we would if we were all joined together. If you want to, please do sing out loud. But do enter into the music right now. Think about the words. Let the music wash over you. Let your heart express praise and prayer to God in this time as we worship together. To my Creator, to my Provider, who brought bread from the heavens and water from rock, I will trust you. To my Sustainer, to my Good Shepherd. stars in the sky and still hears my cry I will trust you
song we just got to sing great is thy faithfulness i love what mark said at the beginning of now more than ever we need to focus our eyes on jesus focus on our eyes on his goodness on his faithfulness and we, last week we introduced a new song uh, promises which just declares just that how great the faithfulness of our god is how great his promise is for us and through any season we put our trust and our faith on that promise. Let's sing together.
one more time together. We sing. Great is your faithfulness to me. God, you're so faithful. God, we believe that if you didn't do another thing, if you won't do another thing, you've already done more than enough. trust in you. And God, in this season, however difficult it may be, we continue to declare that you are faithful. Like the song says, when the sun comes up and when it comes down, you remain. Señor, gracias por tu fidelidad. En la mañana cuando sube el sol y en la noche cuando baja el sol, tú sigues siendo fiel. Ponemos nuestra fe, nuestra confianza en el nombre de Jesús. We put our faith and our trust in the name that is above every other name. That is the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this week. I want to start by saying we miss you and we can't wait to get back together again. Some of you have been asking us, when is the church going to reopen? And without trying to be funny, the answer to that question is we never closed. The church is more than a building or more than an event that takes place. We are the church on a mission together to help people find and follow Jesus. But I know deep down, we're all longing for more because we were made for more. Uh, watching church online for an hour a week is not church. So I want to personally invite you to consider joining us in one of our Facebook groups. As much as we all miss the coffee and donuts on Sunday morning, what we really miss are the conversations and connections with friends and people we meet when we're together in person. So to address that, we've created Facebook groups to help everyone who tunes into our services do that online. Our campus pastors and staff look forward every week to connect with you and come alongside you wherever you are. All you need to do is go to facebook.com slash Menlo Church. We have a group for every campus, and even if you're not a part of one of our physical Bay Area campuses, we have a group for the online community as well. So right after the service, go to facebook.com slash Menlo Church and register, and we'll see you there. Just make sure to bring your own coffee and donuts. And I want to say one more thing before we get into the message today. Thank you so much for your generosity. Our church has been blessed over many generations by the generosity of thousands and thousands of people just like you. Through your giving, we have been able to increase connection with one another and spread hope over the past five months during Shelter in Place. We've launched more life groups in this period of time than we could have ever anticipated. We've served more people in our community and around the world in the face of a global pandemic, including a $65,000 gift this past week from our church to support recovery efforts in Beirut. And every week, tens of thousands of people join us for worship and celebration online. And all of this is made possible through your generosity. As we approach the end of our fiscal year, we'd love to ask you to pray and consider giving an offering or tithe before the end of August so that we can finish the year whole and start the next ministry year strong. We're about 5% behind in our projections, which is a little over a million dollars. Our staff have been stewarding our resources, paying close attention to our expenses, and in the face of uncertainty, we've continued to plan with wisdom and faith. You can also go online to menlo.church and go to our giving pages to see where your generosity goes as well as our latest financial position. Thank you so much for partnering with us to help people find and follow Jesus. Now, what happens when you do what only you can do and trust God to do what only he can do? Let's find out in today's message. Last week, we saw what Jesus can do when the storms of life come crashing down. When life feels like it's falling apart, you're in over your head, Jesus can quiet the winds and the waves of life 
and give us peace. This was a miraculous experience, and some of you believe that it happened just the way it's described in the scriptures. But some of you, you don't take the story literally, which I totally understand. I, I get it. Like, how can you scientifically prove that Jesus was able to quiet a storm? Maybe it was coincidental that he woke up at the same moment as the storm was beginning to settle down. And so for the disciples, this was just more confirmation bias of who they believed he was. Or maybe, maybe it was an exaggeration and the disciples embellished the details to sensationalize the event. I mean, after all, it was only a small group of about a dozen men. They could have conspired together to tell this elaborate story to illustrate Jesus's power over nature. If those are some of your doubts, I totally get it. That's reasonable and it makes a lot of sense. But there are a lot of other miracles attributed to Jesus. That wasn't the only one. A couple chapters later in the Gospel of Mark, there's a story of a miracle of Jesus feeding thousands of people with hardly any food. And this is the only miracle other than the resurrection of Jesus that's recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, most of Jesus' miracles are only recorded in one or two of the Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000 appears in all four. Now, this doesn't mean this miracle is more important than the others, but there are at least a few reasons why all four gospel writers would include this miracle in their account of the life of Jesus. One reason this miracle is recorded in all four gospels is because it's the decisive moment that establishes the identity of Jesus as the promised coming Messiah. For instance, in Luke chapter 9, after Jesus feeds the 5,000, he asks the disciples in private, who do the people say I am? And they respond. Some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah. And then Jesus says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, the Christ of God. This is Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah. So there's a theological reason to the recurrence of this particular miracle in all four Gospels. But there's also a really practical reason it's included in all four Gospel accounts. Simply put, there were a lot of witnesses. Uh, the author tells us that there were 5,000 men, not including women and children. So there were probably between 15 and 20,000 people who witnessed this miracle. And no historical document would have been able to stand the test of time if hundreds or thousands of witnesses contradict, contradicted the actual details of the written account. So that's another reason why all four of the gospel writers included this story. It was a big event and a big deal, and a lot of people saw it happen. So let's look at Mark 6, beginning in verse 32. Mark tells us, so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Now, the first thing I want you to do, the first thing I want to do is I want to give you a little bit of context around this story. Uh, Mark starts by telling us that Jesus and the disciples were trying to get away by themselves for some solitude. They had been traveling together from town to town and they needed some rest. But the main reason why they were trying to find some time alone was because Jesus had just found out that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been executed by King Herod. So Jesus was grieving and he was in pain. And he needed some time and space to mourn this loss with his disciples. But Mark tells us the crowds were following them and knew exactly where he was headed. So they arrived at the place where he was going first and they were waiting for Jesus when he got there. Uh, to say Jesus had a following wherever he went was an understatement. He was like a celebrity. Uh, everyone wanted a glimpse of him. They wanted to hear him teach and see him perform miracles. Uh, a few years ago, I was visiting Boston to attend a family wedding. And having lived there for a number of years, I knew exactly where I wanted to stay as a visiting tourist. So our family, we stayed at a hotel in the Back Bay neighborhood close to Chinatown. Uh, but when we arrived at the hotel, there were throngs of people waiting outside around the block and dozens more in the hotel lobby. And we weren't really sure what was going on. 
there wasn't a special event that we were aware of, and we were pretty tired from traveling, so we just went up to the room and, and crashed for the night. The next morning, I got up and decided to head down to the gym to squeeze in a quick workout before my kids got up. And as I was working out, there was one other person in the gym that morning. He was minding his own business, and I was minding my own business. Eventually, uh, we ended up next to each other on the cardio machines, and I, I turned over for a quick glance, and I was, I was going to say hi. And I kid you not, I almost fell off my machine. I looked over, and it was none other than Shaquille O'Neal. That's right, all seven feet, one inch, 350 pounds of Shaquille O'Neal. I got so excited. I immediately started texting Esther and said, wake up the boys and send them down here quick, fast. And after not hearing back for like a minute, I decided to calmly leave the gym, run upstairs, grab the boys, and come back to take some selfies with Shaq. And as I was walking out of the gym, in walked another former NBA player, Chris Weber, who played for the Sacramento Kings. I tell you this story because at that moment, it dawned on me, and I realized why all those people were standing outside the hotel the night before. They were there because they were famous athletes staying at the hotel. And they wanted autographs and pictures and selfies with these celebrities. And you're probably wondering, did I ask for a selfie? You bet I did. You see, that's the scene that Mark describes right here. He says, many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and they got there ahead of them. And they were waiting for Jesus and the disciples. And I love, I love what Mark writes next. He says in verse 34, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd his heart sank. No, it, it doesn't say that. Listen to what it says. It says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Remember the context here. Jesus is grieving and he's in pain. His heart is heavy with sorrow. And he comes to the shore and he sees this large crowd of, of hurting people and he's not disappointed at all. Instead, he does what he always did. He takes his sorrow and his grief over John and he, he transforms it into compassion for these people, for their pain, their sickness, their loss. Jesus comes and he starts asking people their names and learning their names. He starts praying for people and healing them and, and teaching them. He's speaking good news to them about God's love. And this, this is why we love this man. This is why we love Jesus, because this is quintessential Jesus. He is for others. I've read this story a hundred times, and I'm familiar with all the details, but to really understand the story, you have to put yourself into it. So, so I imagine what it would have been like to be one of the disciples, exhausted, tired, burned out, sad. Uh, the last thing I'd want to see are these large crowds of needy people who want my attention. I mean, can't we just have some time alone and get a break? But Jesus doesn't see the crowds as an inconvenience. In his grief and sorrow, he still does what he always did. He moves toward the people in love. So it tells us that Jesus was teaching them many things, and Mark goes on to write, by this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This was a remote place, and they said, it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, the Greek word here for very late is very late. Uh, translation, Jesus had been teaching for a really long time. Uh, people were getting tired and hungry, and it was probably time to wrap up and call it a night. So what do the disciples do next? It's pretty clever. They're tired, and they're exhausted, and Jesus is going strong. I mean, he's been teaching for hours. So I imagine the conversation they were having among themselves. Like, how long is he going to go? Like, there's no telling when he's going to stop. Like, who wants to be the one to tell Jesus to wrap up the sermon? 
So one of the disciples volunteers to tell Jesus it's getting late and he should send people home because everyone's getting hungry and there's nothing to eat and they should all go back into the village and find food. This was a, a really polite way of telling Jesus it was time to land the plane, finish the sermon, send the people home with a blessing. But listen to what Jesus says in verse 37. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. You, you give them something to eat. Don't send them home, give them something to eat. Okay, their plan backfired. Uh, Jesus didn't get the message. Uh, they were hoping he would wrap things up and call it a night. Send people home and, 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 and Jesus and disciples could finally get some rest and finally have some time alone. But instead of sending the crowds away, Jesus tells them, the disciples, to feed the people. So then Philip responds. He says, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Philip is quick on his feet. I mean, he does some quick math and number crunching, and he tells Jesus that they can't possibly afford to feed all these people. I mean, that would be impossible. But we know from John's gospel, his version, that Jesus was asking this question to test the disciples. Uh, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He knew how he was going to feed the crowds, but he wanted to see if the disciples were willing to do what they could to join him in this moment. So Jesus responds to Philip in verse 38. He says, how many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. Uh, when they found out, they said five and two fish. The disciples might be thinking that Jesus is totally unaware and oblivious, caught up in ministry and teaching. And there are no scenarios where this is going to work. And he's weighing all the possible options to provide for the large crowd of people. There's no money, there's no food. So the disciples are thinking, finally, I think Jesus gets it. I mean, not only can we not afford to feed everyone here, but we've asked around and all we could find were five loaves and two fish. I mean, that's barely enough food for one family. We don't even have the resources to make this happen, they're thinking. So can we please just tell the people that we're done for the day and they can come back tomorrow? And that's precisely when something amazing happens. Look at verse 39. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in Facebook groups. Okay, it doesn't say Facebook groups, but we're, we're about Facebook groups. Jesus directed them to all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Now, Picture yourself as one of the disciples. Jesus takes the loaves and the fishes. He gives thanks. He breaks the loaves and he essentially divides them up among the disciples. So now each one of the disciples has barely half a loaf of bread and just a tiny little piece of fish in their hands. Jesus divides this one lunch among 12 people and then they start going around to these groups of 50 and 100 to, to pass out the food. And as they're passing it out, there's more in their possession than they realize. Uh, they just keep going and going and, and the bread and fish don't run out. They go from group to group to group and they keep passing out bread and fish. And after several hours go by, everyone there has received something to eat. All 20,000 people. In this moment, Jesus is demonstrating his supernatural ability to do what only he can do. And when there's an emergency, a crisis, a need in our lives, there's no panic in heaven. Just like Jesus in the storm last week, he is completely at peace. He knows what he's going to do. The disciples, they, they were focused on solving this problem on their own with what they had or what they didn't have. But here, 
Jesus is showing them that he's more than enough. And with him, there is total sufficiency for all the people's needs. Now, again, some of us will believe this all happened exactly the way it's written, that, that somehow the bread just kept expanding and the, the fish was magically multiplying. Every time they reached in their pockets to pull out food, there was more and it wouldn't run out. But, but I get it. Some of you are thinking, okay, no way. I'm having a hard time chalking this up as another miracle. I mean, there has to be another reason, another explanation for, for what happened here, right? Of course there are. There's lots of explanations, and I'll share a couple of them with you. Uh, a one theologian named Albert Schweitzer says this wasn't a miracle of multiplication. He says this was a miracle of contentment. Uh, in other words, the disciples, they served the crowds with the five loaves and two fish, and they simply did the very best they could with what they had, and they made it go as far as they could. Not very far, but they made it go as far as they could. They maximized their resources. And what happened was the first few groups of people who got a little piece of food, they felt content. It, you know, kind of like when we do communion at church and we just break up the bread in all these tiny little pieces and we serve thousands of people with one loaf and, and one cup. Well, here, everyone had a tiny little piece and they thought it was enough. And, and this was a miracle of contentment more than anything else. And you know, to Schweitzer's credit, Contentment is an important theme, and it is taught in the Bible, just not here in this passage. I mean, how do you explain the 12 basketfuls of leftovers if everyone was content with just a small little piece? Some commentators believe there were 12 basketfuls left over so that each disciple would see Jesus' ability to meet every need. Clearly, there was more left over in the end than what they had started with. The leftovers tell us there was more than enough after everyone had eaten. Another explanation comes from a scholar named William Barclay, and he explains that this was a miracle of sharing. Uh, in the Gospel of John, we're told that the five loaves and two fish, they were offered by a little boy who was in the crowd. He didn't have that much to give, but he gave everything he had, and when everyone saw his generosity, they were all moved and they were inspired and they all started to share what they had. They started to pull out food and provisions. And, and once everybody started doing that, all of a sudden there was plenty. There was more than enough food for everyone to eat. They just needed one person to go first. They needed one example of generosity and sharing to get things started. And, and you know, this too, it is a wonderful lesson. And the Bible teaches on generosity and the scriptures do exhort us to share what we have with others. But that's not what's going on here either. Not a single one of the four gospel accounts mentions anything about anyone sharing anywhere. We have to be careful not to add into these stories something that didn't actually take place. This is an account where Jesus is revealing his power and his authority through another miraculous sign. And every miracle was a sign that pointed people to a spiritual reality about the kingdom of God and who Jesus was. Jesus feeds thousands of people, but notice how and through whom? Through his disciples. Jesus gave the bread to his disciples and the disciples gave the bread to the people. And where did the disciples find the five loaves and two fish? Well, in John's gospel, he tells us they found the food from a boy who he doesn't even get named in this story. He, he doesn't have much to give, but, and he gives everything he has. And with God, that's always more than enough. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen God do amazing things when you or someone else surrendered your time and your ability to him? Uh, miracles are what happen when we do what only we can do and we let God do what only he can do. Uh, imagine what could happen if each one of us invested our time, our abilities, our resources to love and serve others the way Jesus loved and served others. 
I mean, imagine what God could do through our church if we saw people in the Bay Area the way Jesus sees people in the Bay Area, with compassion, like sheep without a shepherd. You might think you don't have much to offer or give, but when you surrender what you have to Jesus, even if it's just five loaves, even if it's just two fish, with Jesus, it is always more than enough. I mean, imagine what God could do if you invested a few hours a week in the lives of kids and students at Menlo Church. Imagine what God could do if you use your skills to organize a life group so others could find community and connection and authentic relationships. Imagine what God could do if you were willing to enter into relationships with people who are not like yourself, with people from different backgrounds or uh, ethnic racial makeup to form new friendships and partnerships. Imagine what God could do if you began to tithe your income and invest in the ministries and the work of your local church. Imagine what God could do if you shared your story and your pain with others who have a similar story of pain as yours. If you give to God and do what only you can do and let God do what only he can do, amazing things begin to happen. Lives get changed. Hearts get healed. Communities get formed. Joy gets multiplied. Hope spreads. And God gets glorified. In John 6, 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus says, the food that I give, it doesn't sustain life. It gives life. Jesus is the bread of life. And with him, there's always more than enough. And with Jesus, anything's possible. Early in the service, we sang an original song called More Than Enough. And I want to close today by singing those words again. You are the God of more than enough faithful to see me through every trial. No need or worry too great for your love. You are the God of more than enough. You are the God of more than enough. Faithful to see me through every trial. us with your love and in light of that we just surrender every anxious thought every trial every situation we may be facing that looks dim 
We surrender it knowing that you are faithful to move on our behalf. So we trust you with everything that we have and we praise you. We love you, Jesus. Let's just sing that chorus one more time. You are the God of more than enough. You are the God of more than enough. Faithful to see me through every trial. There's no need to worry to great for your love. Cause you are the God of more than enough. Well, like we just heard and sang, God is more than enough. He is more than sufficient to walk with you, to walk with us through this day, through this week, through whatever is going on in your life right now. Lean into God because he is enough for you. And may God bless you this day and this week. Thanks for joining us.